It's the nation's favourite antiques experts. I think I found something. Pretty good, yeah. Behind the wheel of a classic car. Oh, stop it. And a go. Scar Britain for antiques. Ooh, I think it's brilliant. The aim? To make the biggest <laughs> profit at auction. But it's no mean feat. You're some man. There'll be worthy winners and valiant losers. <laughs> oh. Will it be the high road to glory? Yeah, baby. Or the slow oh. road to disaster? Oh, oh. This is the awesome. antiques road trip. <laughs> Quite enough of that. Hello from Heavenly Hampshire. And the start of another road trip with Izzy Balmer. Good morning, sir. Are you enjoying your ride? And his most noble, Lord of Collectibles, Charlie Ross. Absolutely loving it, thank you. Goodness, <laughs> what are they playing at today? How did you sleep, sir? Not very well, I'm afraid, Balmer. Not very well indeed. So if you could drive very gently today, I might be able to have a little nod at in the back seat here. I'll do my best, sir. Well, I've never seen a chauffeured Triumph 2000. I wonder if this makes me the valet. You've been driving so beautifully this morning. I've got a little something for you in my pocket. For me, sir? Some sweeties. Some sweeties? Don't turn round. Oh. Keep your eyes on the road. <laughs> oh, my goodness. It says loving you. Oh, sir! No, I've just eaten that one. <laughs> See if we can find something a trifle more appropriate. Sweetheart. Thank there you, you very much, sir. They're rather fizzy, aren't they, Izzy? <laughs> I love a fizzy, Izzy. <laughs> <laughs> Let's leave them playing silly billies for a moment and remind ourselves that jewellery specialist Izzy has triumphed so far with some sparkly buys. I think there might be diamonds. Charlie knows his Chesterfield from his Chippendale. Carry on buying furniture, Ross. With great success, too. <laughs> Who'll stick to their guns this time? Perhaps you could give me a few tips, sir. I could, but I don't want to give you good tips because we simply can't have a chauffeur beating her boss, can we? I'm going <laughs> to have to do some thinking, sir. Thinking? Chauffeurs are not employed to think, is he? No, sir. They're employed to drive. Gosh, we've done a bit of Downton Abbey there. Well, Sir Charlie, you'll be playing with a piggy containing just over £250 on this leg, which is good. But young upstart Izzy has a touch more. Oh, yes, £289.88. She's just ahead. Have you ever been lost in a wood, Izzy? No, sir, I don't believe that I have. No. Have you, sir? Oh, several times, yes. Were you alone, sir? No, Izzy, I wasn't. <laughs> Would you mind driving on? There'll be no getting lost on this trip. They started in the Cotswolds, then wandered into Wales before heading easterly to the home counties. Her trip along the south coast will conclude with a final auction in battle. I'm just checking on my shares. I hope they're going to go up enough for me to buy you a sumptuous supper tonight, Barman. That's very good to hear, sir. Don't forget me, the valet. <laughs> the third leg of this jaunt will end at auction in Exeter, but we start proceedings in the Hampshire village of Hartley Whitney. Charlie going solo, popping into White Lion Antiques. What could be more delightful? Quite an array of delights, eh? I'm sure you'll find something classy here, Charlie. Ah, another piece of furniture. Late George III, tambour top, writing table. And there's a bit of a clue in the price here as to the way Furniture's going. £678. Sale price, £350. Not a lot of money, but more money than I've got. Anything more than in budget. There's a silver-topped sugar shaker there. Shiny. Izzy will be jealous. 1925. Cut glass body. Priced at £19. There's always a twist. It can't be without damage. Time for closer inspection. Yeah, it's had a bit of damage around the top. You can see that from the neck here. That's why it's presumably 19 pounds, but the cut glass body of this sugar sifter, as far as I can see, is intact. I'll have it. Thank you very much. No need to negotiate. 
because it's £19 and it's a profit. Sweet find, then. Let's leave Charlie to browse on. And catch up with Izzy. Like a lot of fun chauffeuring Charlie this morning. He's much less irritating, actually, when he's in the back. Probably because he's further away. <laughs> Keep him at arm's length. Good tactic. Izzy's first shop is in Newbury, Berkshire. She's popping into the town's emporium. Brimming full of curious collectibles to tempt her to part with some of that £289. Oh, crap. I should give you a name. How about Colin? Do you like Colin? This reminds me, <laughs> my friend does the most amazing crab dance. I probably can't even do it justice, but it's like this and then... And then his legs start going and I just can't... <laughs> I don't... What do crab legs do? Oh, yes. A sideways shuffle. Oh, oh, oh yes. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't do it justice. <laughs> What's Colin's price, then? Oh, my goodness me, he's £300. Colin... I love you, but you are not for me, I'm afraid. I shall have to do my solitary crab dance alone. Dear, oh dear. So long, Colin the Crab. Let's nip back to Hartley Whitney, see if Charlie's grabbed anything worth shelling out on. <laughs> Who writes this stuff? This has taken my fancy not because it's of any great age, although it's 1950s, but it's a rather splendid shopping list. It's after an illustration by Mabel Lucy Atwell, very famous illustrator of children's books. Most of all, I remember for Alice in Wonderland. I just love the idea of this. Shopping will be easy if you will insist that when you're running short of things, they'll put down on this list. Is the price just as poetic? It's £22. I think somebody would buy that for fun. Shame it's not original, but it would be hundreds of pounds if it were. I think you might make a profit. Charlie now has two possible buys. Meanwhile, 30 miles away... Oh, look at these piggies! Three little piggies. I really like these. They're bronze pigs and they've got the maker's initial on the bottom, which is for Michael Simpson. They are 20th century. He studied in Staffordshire and he's known for his bronze figures of animals. But they're so realistic looking and they're so cute. And they're little piggies. Oink, oink. <laughs> and the price? £100. Oh, I'm going to put these back because I might have to have a little think about them. But also, what is this? This is a patch box or a pill box. Patch boxes would have been used in the Georgian period um, to, to store the patches that they used to put on their faces. These patches were faux beauty spots and became fashionable from the 17th century in France. They signalled wealth and luxury. And wherever you put the patch on your face, it meant something different. So there's a whole language of patches. You know, once patches went out of fashion, little trinket boxes were still being made to store pills in. The catch is a little bit loose, and there is, unfortunately, a crack across the top. It is only £15, a lot cheaper than the piggies. Charlie's snapping at my heels now, which means he's got a good chance of overtaking me, and I really don't want that to happen. I don't know whether to go with the pigs, who I love, or go with the pillbox, which is a safer bet. While you're making your mind up, how's Charlie doing? I love a tin plate toy. And this is a Seawolf submarine. It's 1960s or even possibly 1970s. But what do we say about toys? Mint and box is what we like, M and B. Well, it's boxed. I wouldn't say it's mint, although I can't see any damage on it whatsoever. Price? £79. I think if I could buy that for £50 or £60, there would be a squeak in it, because these sort of things are highly collectible and going up in value. Time to get the owner on the blower and do a deal. Hello. Your Seawolf submarine, you could do it 40 quid. You, sir, are a total gentleman, and I'm so pleased I phoned you. Yeah, well done. Time to talk money on the other two possible items. A silver-topped sugar shaker. Beautiful. It's £19, and who am I to argue? That must be a misprint. <laughs> £19, bargain, no. well done. And the illustrated kitchen shopping list? 
Right. What's the very, 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 very best? I think he could probably go to about £18 on that. I'm going to have it, sir. 80 That's £77 for the Sugar Shaker, Shopping List and Submarine, as you do. Thank you very much. Just over £173 left to spend. Izzy must have made a decision by now, too. As much as I adore the pigs, I don't think I can make any money on them. Whereas, hopefully, there's a small profit in this one. So it's a safe bet for me today. Good choice. Gary! Hello. Hello. I really like this little trinket box, and it's priced at £15, so I'm just going to hand you over some money, if that's OK. That's great. Here we are, then. Glitzy purchase made and around £275 left in the purse. Meanwhile, Charlie's heading to the town of Basingstoke. He's put shopping on hold to detour to a local firm that's been trading hereabouts for over 50 years, but has a long history stretching back to 1890. The company's founder, Charles Blatchford, pioneered a new approach to prosthetics at a time when artificial limbs had not kept up with other advances in medical science. Hello, David. Hello, welcome to Blatchford's. Thank you very much indeed. Charlie's meeting head of research, Dr David Moster. Wow, this is really state-of-the-art, isn't it? How far back do we have to go for the first prosthetic limb, do we think? Well, the records seem to show that the first prosthetic devices date back to ancient Egypt times. Really? A big toe, which was found on a mummy. Believed to be 3,000 years old, it was made by top craftsmen of the time and aimed to provide the aristocratic user with a sense of wholeness in Egyptian society also stopped him limping. The thinking was that not only did it help preserve the, the look of the foot, but it was also yeah. really important in wearing the footwear of the time. As we go through the ages, wars must have had a huge impact on what was needed. War has been one of the biggest, I think, drivers in development of prosthetics, simply to account for the needs of the many individuals who came back with such horrific injuries. Yes. In the Middle Ages, the first articulated prosthetic limbs were made of iron or wood by skilled armourers, allowing injured soldiers to go straight back to the battlefield and continue to fight. But the advancement of prosthesis over the centuries was slow to catch up with the rest of medical science. The game-changer came with an incredible development in the early 19th century. The Battle of Waterloo, one of the most famous legs is called the Anglesey leg. And really, that sort of design carried on through several hundred years. Yeah. Invented by James Potts in 1800, the world's first articulated leg was named after the first Marquis of Anglesey, who used it when he lost a leg during the Battle of Waterloo, and who famously said, by gad, sir, I seem to have lost my leg. Prosthetics like these were skillfully crafted, taking many hours to produce and costing a fair bit of cash, too. First World War, there was a need to standardise the engineering yep. and make a much greater volume of prosthetic limbs yes. to deal with the number of casualties. So it introduced a change in the way limbs were manufactured and designed. Yes. And that's really driven innovation to what we call modern prosthetics today. Yeah. Charles Blatchford's mission was to create affordable prosthetics, allowing injured veterans an active lifestyle. He purchased various prosthetic patents and then improved on what had gone before. This is one of the first aluminium alloys that was invented. Yeah. And this was quite popular during the First World War. Basically, with the birth of aviation, the, the metal knowledge and engineering made its way into prosthetics. Due to the high number of veterans coming back from the conflicts in World War I and World War II, there was a need to manufacture or fit limbs at a much higher rate. Yeah. And that really heralded the, the modern era of prosthetics, where much of the device or the leg could be assembled very quickly from a standard set of components, mm -hmm. and it would just leave the, the socket or the, the interface that had to be handcrafted to the user. Yes. Work like Blatchford's changed lives overnight and allowed for the wearers to go back to living life to the full. 
This is the BSK, the Blatchford Stabilizing Knee. Right. And it works like a brake mechanism. You can see this leather band oh, yes. rotates on this drum. So when weight is applied and the knee's flexed, it acts like a braking mechanism. Yeah. And that meant that the wearers could stabilize themselves, weight bearing as the knee was flexed. Yeah. It provides a lot more stability and security. The fast pace of post-war medicine and the creation of plastics means state-of-the-art prosthetics can be developed by engineers like David today. The best prosthetic limbs are the ones the users aren't really aware of. Mm -hmm. It's just adapting and, and adjusting as they need it. Yeah, and then this is looking a bit sort of Olympic game -ish. That's right, this is for athletes. So yeah. it's designed purely about performance and quite a specific activity, sport. If you take that to its nth degree, presumably you can end up running faster than an able body. It might happen one day. Okay. That would be astounding. Time to meet with engineer Daryl and help build a state-of-the-art prosthetic. So what I've got to do is get the heel on here. Yep, that's right? correct, yep. Screws go Screws. in. And apply one, the, apply the apply glue. Apply the glue. A little bit on there. Yep. And then line them up. That's it. And then, oh, I see, yep. I've got it. There we go, the Charlie Ross foot. Lovely. Thank you very much <laughs> indeed. Well done, Charlie. That's remarkable engineering. With her first purchase securely in the glove box, chauffeur's Izzy is back on the road. You know what? I think there's been enough crab dancing for one day. Can't spoil everyone with it. Got to keep it back to surprise people with and, and wow them with it. Always keep them wanting more, eh? Izzy's making her way to the town of Hungerford, nestled in the North Wessex Downs. Hello, Mr Squirrel. Do you know the way to the next shop? Right, is it? Much obliged. Ah, here we are. It is packed. Dealer Stewart has five rooms of stock crammed in. Are you first? Thank you. But Izzy's heading out back to see what's hidden away. This is an Aladdin's cave, isn't it? Stewart's storeroom, full of treasures. I think I might have found something. I'm presuming it's a letter holder, it's a letter, letter rack. rack. There's a bit of damage on it need looking at. Is that remnants of paint or enamel or something? Uh, gilding, I should think, on those parts. Because quite leaves. often, yeah. Yeah. And there's an antenna I'm missing yeah. there. Oh, it's it's probably thing. continental, probably French, looking at the nut and the thread there. Yeah, not common things. No. It? Wouldn't take a lot to doing up, actually. Lovely find, is he? What else can you uncover? <gasps> Stuart! What have you found? What I you found some of these jelly moulds. So they would put pâtés or pâtés. fish, yeah, I hadn't thought of and then they turn them out. I'd kind of presumed the ones that, like you know, like the chicken or like the lobster, that you'd put something savoury relating to that. Yeah, that'd be probably you know, chicken, chicken pâté. Yeah. Pâtés that, that's make horseshoe sense. Pâté. <laughs> I don't know what that and is. thistle pâté. Uh, yes, that's a tricky <laughs> subject. Or maybe this would be thistle jelly, perhaps. <laughs> yeah, that's Harrods. So that means that was sold by Harrods. Just out of interest, that one. Yeah, just on. Obviously, they need a set stood up, and that's what helps it stand up, of course. You know, on the flat. Oops. <laughs> right, that's two possibles. Time to talk prices. Say, the chicken and one horseshoe, even with the butterfly for 40 quid. That seems very fair, because then I could get two lots out of that, couldn't I? So it's £10 for these and £30 for the butterfly, and that makes £40 in total. It does. Here we go, £40. Have a job. Deal done, and you still have over £230 left. Time to motor on and collect Charlie. Still in character, are we? I must say, if you eat with me tonight and then beat me in the third leg, I'm afraid I shall have to go for another chauffeur. You would not discard me so easily, sir. I might. <laughs> he seems to be enjoying his new status too much. Nighty night. Morning is broken and it's a new day for our sprightly road trippers. Rolls reversed and it's driving Miss Izzy this time. 
morning, Charles. Good morning, madam. I'm not really accustomed to this role of chauffeur, madam. No, I can tell. Is it comfortable, madam? Well, the back is very comfortable. You're driving, however. Yes? It's a little on the bumpy side. On the bumpy side, madam? I prefer it smoother, Charles. You prefer it smoother? First thing in the morning. <laughs> very good, madam. <laughs> I'll see what I can do. <laughs> Do you mind the potholes? If you had to sum up our road trip together in three words... Three words? Thing? Three words. You were only allowed three words. Simply marvellously magical. And you? Four words? Four words. A waste of time. <laughs> 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 well, Izzy wasted no time in buying three items. This is an Aladdin's cave, isn't it? Spending a total of £55 on an Edwardian agate pillbox, a butterfly brass letter rack, and two food moulds. Let's shake on it. Thank you so okay. much. Okay. She has just shy of £235 in her pocket. Charlie purchased a cut glass shaker. £19, and it's a profit. A Mabel Lucy Atwell shopping list and a boxed toy submarine. I love a tin plate toy. Negotiating this lovely lot for a total of £77, leaving him just over £173 for today. Amazing. We don't really go for the same things, do we? No, we don't. You go for old bits of boring wood. <laughs> well, I am old and boring. <laughs> Typecast. <laughs> and I You'll go get... for sparkly, glitzy things. But yes, little bits of trivia. <gasps> you want to stick with that? Oh, oh. you want to stick with that? Stick with your jewellery and you'll win. <laughs> it's certainly still all to play for. After dropping off his passenger, Charlie's motoring the Triumph into Wiltshire and the city of Salisbury. He's popping into the city's antiques market. Where there's a veritable feast of antiques and collectibles. On a previous road trip, Charlie did business with dealer Peter. He must be about here somewhere. Peter! Hello, hi, nice to meet you. We meet again. We do. Have you found anything interesting, anything come through the door in the last few days? I could have a little look. Peter always got a little supply here of things. And uh, I think last time I came here, I managed to find something rather nice. Oh, this is always promising. What have you got in there? Mm. Oh, look! If you went to a Scottish dinner party, you'd have one of these, and it's for your whiskey. Known as the noggin. This one's got its label, which is most unusual. And when you had your haggis and your neeps, you poured your own whiskey. I mean, how cool is that? Got anything else? Anything that might be lurking there? Well, if I look at that, it looks like a Sheraton knife box. So, we'll open this up. And this is not a knife box. It's got a chamber stick in there, which looks like a taper stick. These boxes were often termed go-to-beds, allowing matches to safely burn down and offer just enough light to retire to bed. Sweet. What a wonderful design. Oh, I can see a hallmark on there. It's an anchor, it's Birmingham and it's on a sea. 1902. Maker's mark's been rubbed, but... <sighs> it's a nice thing. Kind of everything. It's a pretty thing. How much is that? Unique thing, £100. You wouldn't take 50 quid for it, would you? No, I didn't think you would. <laughs> Got to start somewhere, haven't you, Peter? This is it. This is, this is it. Hang on, this is it. 80 quid. Sold. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's a great thing. 80. It really is. And that little find could do big things at auction. Fingers crossed. <laughs> Izzy, meanwhile, has put a halt to her shopping and is visiting Whitchurch on the River Test, where the waters powered the wheels of industry in the 19th century. There was once a working mill on the Test every half a mile, due to Hampshire's position between ports on the south coast and markets in London. Once at the centre of Britain's booming Victorian silk industry, Whitchurch Mill is still in production, determined to preserve its luxurious silk-making heritage. Izzy is with director Sue Tapless, and the story starts 
at the Great Water Wheel. We use a system of bypass sluices to get as much water underneath our water wheel as we possibly can. That then drives the paddles and it pushes the water wheel round, which then through a system of drive belts and cogs takes the power to the top floor. Can I have a go? Yes, of course you can. Um, I was expecting it to be heavier. It's very well lubricated. I keep going. Am I not there yet? No, no. Probably about a foot more till you get to that line. Foot? About a foot. It's an absolute arm workout. <laughs> <laughs> they would have done this throughout the day to get the best flow of water. You can hear it rushing underneath the water wheel, yeah. turning those paddles. You can see nothing in the silk industry is fast. Put your back into it, Izzy. Legend has it that the process of silk production was discovered by the Chinese and was a closely guarded secret for centuries. Strong demand for local silk production in Europe led to two monks in 550 AD smuggling silkworms from China to Constantinople, the ancient city today known as Istanbul. But by the late 17th century, the Spitalfields area of London produced most of Britain's silk. To reduce costs, manufacturers took production out of London. Silk is a natural product. It comes from the silk moth, the Bombyx mori. It produces a cocoon, which is actually the silk yarn that we work with. So once it's spun its cocoon, it pupates into a moth and these are put into hot soapy water where the threads of silk unravel and we can reel off about a mile of filament silk from this. A mile? A mile from of silk. From one of those? Yes. Silk weaving is an intensive process. Away from London, a cheaper workforce in places like Whitchurch allowed mill owners to increase production and profit. This once exclusive product was becoming affordable for many. In 1886, the mill's reputation for producing quality silk led to owner James Hyde to strike a deal to make the linings of raincoats for Burberry. Business boomed. But by the 1950s, cheaper imports from the Far East and commercial mills heavily investing in new silk weaving technology signalled troubled times. We really survived because Stephen Waters, a silk producer, bought the mill as a sort of industrial treasure. He wanted to keep it going because it preserved old technologies and old skills. We were sold to Eden Ravenscroft, who made QC gowns for Queen's Council. So when you went from being a barrister to a QC, you became a silk, you wore silk robes. And those were woven here on our Victorian machinery. In the 1980s, Eden Ravenscroft decided they didn't want to run the silk mill anymore. The proposal was that this silk mill and the grounds were turned into housing development, but there was an absolute cry from the people of Hampshire who wanted to preserve the machinery, the skills, the site as a working museum. It's wonderful to see the traditions and the crafts being kept alive today. There's nowhere else in the country that you can learn these skills. Today, the mill produces bespoke silk fabrics for costumes and large wall hangings using traditional processes still practised by silk weaver Hannah Futcher. So you take your threads in order from the back and poke your hook through the eye and the lish and then pull it through and you do that for every single thread. I can go to the back and pass them through to you. Oh, and then oh it doesn't go through very... Oh, it does, I see. I can hook that on and pull it through. Goodness me. <laughs> Yay, I did it! I'd love to see it in action. Yeah, so if you grab your ear defenders, we can turn it on. Though the glory days of the British silk industry are over, the wheels of this mill continue to turn. By George. Back in the Triumph, is Charlie happy with his buy so far? I'm really thrilled with my little take a stick, my go to bed, which still leaves me just shy of £100 to spend. Yeah, Charlie's taking his wad to the port city of Southampton. Land ahoy! His last buying destination of this trip is Robin's Nest Emporium. Eyes peeled, Roscoe, for some final buys. Going somewhere, are you? Wow. 
wonderful old case, and I bet that's seen some life. Beautifully made, heavy gauge leather, and it's got all these labels on it. Now, of course, what do people do nowadays? To give it extra provenance and value, they buy labels, and they rub them in the mud, and they tear them in half, and they stick them on, and they pretend they're old. But I'm absolutely certain, looking at the colour of these and the texture of them, I don't think you could wear something like that. There we are, look, Port of Landing, Liverpool. I bet there are some fascinating places on there. The ticket price is £65. Tempted? Lovely. Ooh, and look who's just arrived with £230 to spend. Straight away, she's made a friend. Hi. Hello, I'm Lorna. I'm Izzy. And I'm Tim. Is everything on here yours? Absolutely, yep. Ooh, I'll All have up for negotiation look. as well. That's what I like to hear. I was just looking at those and they did catch my eye. I can't even play snooker. I'm trying to think. Are they a complete set? Yes, they are. There is instructions in the box if we get lost. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, there is some in there. Do you know how old this set is? I should imagine it's 1950s, just by looking at the box, but I wouldn't have any more information than that, really. So what have you got it priced at? It's actually £25, but that's for the set and the scoreboard as well. And actually, what I'll do, I'll even throw that in as well, the travelling chess set for you. So then I could have, like, a little game slot. You could do. Is there anything more we can do on the price? About £18? Yes. That's very fair. Still no jewellery bought. Unlike Izzy, this. I wonder how Charlie's getting on. Charlie, what are you doing slacking? I'm not slacking, I'm having a cup of coffee. And look what I brought you. Yeah. Well, I've kind of got shopping to do, Get Charlie. On with it. Oh, all right then. I mean, I suppose I am ahead. I beg you. <laughs> Come on, Charlie. Back to it. I mean, in which case, I'd better go and buy it. I've just spilled coffee all down myself. <laughs> I love a teddy. It's got the little Merry Thought button. It's got some age. Merry Thought started in 1930. Merry Thought is Britain's oldest surviving teddy bear manufacturer and derives its name from a wishbone, meaning good luck. He's 38 pounds. There's another one here. Oh, I think he's been a growler. But he doesn't growl anymore. You can feel the mechanism of the growl. Come on. Oh, it does work. Although that was me. It was very convincing, Charlie. I love those two. What's he? 24. Oh, cracky, the best part of 60 pounds. There's not a profit in those at the moment, but there might be later. Shop manager Carol, get dealer Charmaine on the blower, please. Charlie, why don't you have the two for 30 pounds? The two for £30. Can I blow a kiss to you down the phone? Well, I'd rather you drove by personally, but OK, then. <laughs> rather I drove by personally. Well, mwah. Ah, kisses and bear hugs all round. And with that, Charlie's shopping is complete. Lovely. Good luck with your bears. Thank you. Now, where's Izzy got to? Hello. Hello. Hi, I'm Izzy. I'm Rob. Nice, nice to, to meet you, Rob. Hi. I spotted this suitcase. Uh-oh. Didn't Charlie have his eye on that earlier? And what I've spotted, or rather like about it, are the luggage labels that are on it. We've already heard about those. What's it like inside? But it's very smart, I don't smart, really know. It's it? nice. And it's even got this for hanging your trousers or dress or something over to keep it nice and neat inside the case. Can it be really cheap? I did buy this fairly well, so... I wouldn't really be wanting to pay much more than £30. 35 Yeah, 35 That'd be amazing. Yes, okay. thank you very much. Thank you. Izzy's made her final purchases. The snooker balls, travel chess set and the leather suitcase, all for £53. All systems go. All systems go. Drive on, Charles. Thank you, madam. <laughs> Shall we go for a cocktail? Let's go for champagne. Sleep tight. Ring a ding a ding. It's auction day. Here is the cathedral city of Exeter, where my parents got married. The second most popular city in Devon. Let's hope everyone's turned up at the sale room. Are you feeling confident? Oh, I'm not sure, Charlie. I mean, I can't keep up with you at this pace. <laughs> because I'm running for profits. 
Yes, hurry, hurry, hurry. The auction's about to start. We're at the end of the third leg on this trip. After setting off from Hartley Whitney, our experts have raced their way to Exeter. Today's auction is being held at Beerns, Hampton and Littlewood. On this trip, Izzy bought five lots for the grand total of £108. Aha! I recognise this. I spent many, many minutes looking at this, but it was £65. But, Izzy, you've bought it for £35. I don't know how you do it. With bags of charm, that's how. <laughs> Charlie parted with £187, also on five lots. I love this. This is fabulous. And it takes all the boxes. It's novelty, it's miniature, it's silver. It, strictly speaking, is usable. You could light your way up to your bedroom at night. I wish that I'd seen this. Nice find, Charlie. Well done. In charge of the gavel is auctioneer Brian Goodison Blanks. What does he make of today's lots? The snooker balls and the travel chess set, they're probably suffering from a digital age where most people are playing games online. I don't know many people who play snooker or travel chess at the moment. They're probably going to be 10 to 15 pounds. The yellow submarine is one of my favourite pieces in its original box. It doesn't look as if it's too play-worn. Very popular in the yellow colour, probably because of the song that was popular at the time. This one, I think, would do quite well, about 40 to 60 pounds. Well, let's hope it rises to the occasion and attracts bids in the room and on the phone. Now, get a shifty on. The auction's about to start. Here we are. Yeah. Auction number three. First up is his suitcase. Can it bag a profit? It's nice to see one with original labels. They're not fake labels. No. Commissions with me at 5, 8, 10, 12, 15 pounds. At 15? 15? Bit at 18 fresh plates. Better. And 20, 22, and hat. 20 with me. Oh, oh, no. 20 pounds then, two at I'm all. so pleased I didn't at buy 20 it. 20 pounds oh. then for the case. 20 with my commission bid. The suitcase didn't take off, but there are more lots to come. <laughs> Don't but cry, is this is clean. Uh, it's always clean. I keep it for young girls to mop their eyes with when they've lost money in auction. It's Charlie's first lot now. The cut glass sugar shaker. But Charlie, you're sweet enough. <laughs> <laughs> commission bid here with me at ten pounds. Oh, ten. You're quite sure then at ten pounds with my commission. Oh, no. Farm note for the no. sugar shaker. Ten pounds only with my commission. No oh, sweet smell of success there. It's a small loss. Never mind. Keep perky. Keep perky, Roscoe. It's only money. Will Izzy's brass butterfly letter rack be worth a flutter? What's it made of? Brass and other metals. Brass. 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 I'm from the north. Brass. Repeat after me. Brass. Brass. What can you do? Uh, five, eight, ten, twelve, fifteen. Fifteen oh. is here. Eighteen, oh, thank you. Oh, yes, got a chance. It's a bit low. Twenty-two. A bidder has walked away with a great prize. Bargain. A snip. A butterfly. Next up, Charlie's Mabel Lucy Atwell style shopping list. Reminded me of my youth, being born in 1950. You know, oh, I thought you were born earlier than that. Well, it was 1850. <laughs> You're praying. Are you praying? Here at five, eight, ten, twelve, fifteen, fifteen pounds. Fifteen pounds. I paid eighteen. With a commission in the book at fifteen. Someone has a bargain for their kitchen wall. It's only a little last. Is his only sparkly item, the agate pillbox. Only problem is there is a crack in the top of the agate. Don't want cracked agate, do you? Not really. A commission at ten pounds here. Well, that's a start. It's a start. Ten pounds. At ten. Oh, is he? Oh, ten pounds. Oh, Charlie. Oh, any bids at all? At ten. <laughs> Never mind. It's only a small loss. Oh, is he? Oh, dear. <laughs> now, will someone take care of Charlie's well-loved teddies? They remind me of you. They're all cute and charming and cuddly and furry. Well, <laughs> 19, silver, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 10, 12, 15, 18, 20, 22, 25, 28, 30, 32, 35, 38. Well, I have 40 in the room. A bit more. 38 is my commission. Someone loves a teddy, too, and it's clawed a profit. It's just a profit. 
So I'm not going to walk out on you. I was rather looking forward to you walking out on me, watching you storm up in a tantrum. Not the usual buy for Izzy now, it's the vintage snooker items and chess set. Which colour balls do you put in the triangle? All of them. No. Five, eight, ten, ten. Oh, ten. ten. Six. Oh, is he? Quite well, 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 15. Oh, pounds come on. At 15 pounds, of course. So far. 15 pounds and I'll sell. Izzy's bought nice things, but that's the fourth consecutive loss. Ouch. Oh, Another small loss. Another small loss. Rubber dub dub, it's Charlie's sub. <laughs> but you know what submarines do, right? They sink. They sink. At 12, 15, 18, 20, 20 pounds, 22, 25, 28, 32, 35, 38. 38 I have. Oh, 40 no, fresh plates. 42, 45, 48, 55, 60. Charlie. 55 I have. 60 fresh plates. Is he, was he? Charlie is Quite sure then. If you're selling at 60, you're all done. Popping up with a lovely profit. Oh. Your smile's got bigger. I know, I'm feeling so buoyant. Next is his final lot, her two Victorian moulds. I love aspic. I don't think I've ever had aspic. It's a sort of savoury jelly. It's quite posh. Your well, that's why you know about it and I don't. <laughs> Interest here, early stages at five, eight, ten. Ten pounds is here. Do I have to buy elsewhere? Ten pounds then for the two moulds. Sure then. Oh, is he? At ten pounds. No profit, but a break-even does save her blushes. <laughs> oh, dear. They've gone mouldy. I predict this one will do well. Charlie's go to bed. Imagine wee Willy Five, Winky going nine, to bed with this. I can imagine you with wee Willy Winky. With a sure. night cap nine, and a night shirt nine, on. Yes, that's how I go to bed every night. Starting at 40, 5, 50, 5, 60, 5, 70, 5, 80, 5, 90, 5, 100, and 10, 120, 130, 140, 150 in the room. Double your money and try to get 60, 170, 170, 180, 190, 200. You quite sure, Ryan? 200, 200 pounds then. <laughs> yes! <laughs> Roscoe! Well, look at that. A massive profit for Charlie. Let's go outside and count up my oh, money. Oh, must we? I'll get the calculator. <clears throat> Izzy started with just short of £290. After auction costs, she finishes today with just over £245 in her piggy. Charlie began with £250 and 10p. After his auction costs, he's made a profit of just over £77, taking him into the lead for the first time for the next leg. Well done, that man. <laughs> Is that a spring in your it's step? It's a spring in my step. <laughs> Things are looking up. Have I overtaken you? You've overtaken me, well and truly. Oh, this is time to go to bed. Pip, pip. <laughs> <laughs>